Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. And he, I still hear the pages flipping, I want you to get there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. And he that hath ear, let him hear with the Spirit. And it's a capital S because it's the Holy Spirit in the tribulation saint. With the Spirit saith unto the church of it's said to all seven churches, and they're here that away. They're there to hear and listen with the Holy Spirit, and that would match church age doctrine. You ought to hear the same way. You have the Holy Spirit in you, so you ought to hear the same way. Now it says, to him that overcometh. We talked about that. That's overcoming in the great tribulation, and it's not aimed at a Christian. A Christian doesn't overcome. A Christian's already overcome. He's saved. So it's aimed at somebody in the great tribulation not taking the mark of the beast. So when he overcomes there, he does not take the mark. All right. Now it says, Will I give to eat of the hidden manna? So if he doesn't overcome, he doesn't get the hidden manna. He only gets the hidden manna if he overcomes the mark of the beast in the tribulation. Now, the hidden manna. So, in order to get the hidden manna, you have to understand, first of all, not the word hidden, you must have to understand the word manna first. You'll never get the word hidden manna if you don't know what manna is to begin with. So, take your Bible and turn to the book of Exodus and turn to Exodus chapter 16, Beginning with manna, Exodus chapter 16. And let's pick up verse 1 to see some things about this manna. All right. Uh, and he took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel come unto the wilderness of sin. All right. The wilderness of sin, that is their one month into the wilderness. They have come up out of Egypt. They've been in Egypt for 400 years. And they come out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea and they go into the wilderness. And they're one month into the wilderness. That's important. Because this manna, write it down in your notes, this manna they eat for 40 years in the wilderness. And as soon as they cross the Jordan River, uh, going into the promised land, the manna stops. So it lasts for exactly and only 40 years. And it lasts every single day. Exodus chapter 16, verse uh, 3, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat at the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. So when they say that, the Lord's ticked. The Lord's mad. And ye have brought us forth into this wilderness. Underline it. They're in a wilderness. First of all, underline the word wilderness in verse 1. Uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. They're in a wilderness. That's very important. Uh, verse 3. They're in a wilderness. Now, take your Bible and turn to Revelation. Keep your hand right there because we're going to come back to this manna. But turn to Revelation chapter 12 and see the connection with the uh, Jewish nation and this manna. Revelation chapter 12, and let's pick up verse 13. We'll go back and pick up verse 13. We want 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Uh, Lanny, Lanny, give him a set of notes. Dennis, give Dennis a set of notes. He'd come in late. <laughs> But uh, it's okay, and Dennis. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm not, uh, I like people to. No, I'm not. Gonna, what am I talking about? <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, okay, underline that. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, okay, question: Who is the dragon? Satan, the devil. Okay, now think about it a minute. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, what happens when the seven-headed dragon, the seven-headed dragon, comes down to earth? What happens? 
he becomes a man. He becomes a man incarnate. So the dragon becomes a man. It's a satanic trinity. You have God the Son, and what he is, he, he's God the Father. He has the Holy Spirit. He's all three. Absolutely. No. And at that point, he can't go back and forth. When he becomes a man, he can no longer go back to the throne room and accuse anybody because he's cast down to the earth. The war that takes place, takes place in chapter 12 with the devil and his angels and he's cast out of heaven, out of the second heaven, and cast down to this earth and he becomes a man. He can no longer go back up. So it's from the tribulation on, his, he can't go back up. Now, verse uh, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman. Now this woman here is in verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, and you want to write it in the margin of your Bible. This woman represents Israel, the nation of Israel. Verse 1, And there opened a great uh, wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and a moon under her feet. And upon her head were uh, crowns of twelve stars. You read this uh, passage all the way through here from verse 1 all the way down. You see the woman is represented by not Mary, not Mary, but by the nation of Israel. Now, verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman. So what does the devil do? He persecutes the Jews. So during the tribulation period, right here, the Jews are going to be persecuted by the devil. Write this in the note in, note in your Bible. The Jews are going to be persecuted by the devil, who is the Antichrist. The devil wants to kill the Jews. Now, uh, that, uh, now watch verse 14. Uh, and the woman, and the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly unto the, underline it, wilderness. Underline the word wilderness. It'll show up several times throughout uh, the verses we'll be going over. Wilderness. She's just like she was back there in the book of Exodus. She was in the wilderness. She's in the wilderness here. She's in the wilderness back there. She come up out of Egypt in the wilderness. Identical. So you want to underline it. Now, Unto her place. She has a particular place. These, these places are named in the Old Testament. For she is, now underline the next word, nourished, nourished. Uh, the word in the other scriptures, it used the word feed. She's fed with manna. She's nourished. Lanny? Oh, okay, you're, you're ahead of me. <laughs> For the face of the serpent, from the face of of the serpent. The serpent, of course, is the devil. We went across the verses on the devil. All right. Now, go back to uh, the book of uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. And so keep in mind this wilderness as the children of Israel have crossed out of Egypt and are in the wilderness for 40 years. They're fed every day with this thing called manna. Now, uh, verse 4, Exodus 16, 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. Underline that. Bread from heaven. That's what it's called. Now we got some verses we're going to check on John. But before we check on those verses in John chapter 6, we need to get a few more verses on this thing called manna. All right. Uh, verse uh, 4. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them, underline that, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So this is a test to them. So they have to get up in the morning and out there on the ground uh, is, is a, a bunch of frost. And then on top of that frost, there's some other stuff that falls on top of it and it's called manna. Now, verse 5, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, Ye shall prepare that which ye brought in, and it shall be twice as much as ye gathered daily. So underline in verse 5, twice as much. So on the sixth day, that means on uh, 
Friday, you gather enough for two days instead of one day. All right? So you have uh, verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At evening, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. In the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that ye hear your murmuring against the Lord. And what are we that we murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to full, for that the Lord uh, heareth your murmurings, which murmured against him, which uh, are we. Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. That's very important. Underline in the last part of verse 8. Your murmurings are not against us. Well, they were talking against Moses and Aaron. But actually, their murmuring was what? Against God, but against the Lord. Now, verse 9. So you be careful. You might murmur against somebody and find out you're actually murmuring against the Lord. So be careful what you say when you murmur. Verse 9. And Moses spake unto Aaron, and said unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it come to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared into the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard your murmurings of the children of Israel, speak unto them, and say, At evening ye shall flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it come to pass that at evening the quail came up and covered the camp, and the morning the dew uh, lay around about the host. So underline in verse 13, In the morning... The dew lay around about the host. So the dew falls, and then on top of that falls this manna. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing. Now, uh, look at, skip over to verse 21. Verse 21. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it did what? Verse 21. So underline that in verse 21. When the sun waxed hot, it melted. So this manna, whatever it is, it looks like hail, or it looks like frost, it looks like snow. And when the sun heats it up, it melts. Now, verse 14. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, the face of the wilderness, there's that word again, the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoary frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wished not what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread, underline that, underline the word manna in verse 15, underline the word, This is bread. Bread, that's what it is. This is bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Uh, this is the thing which the Lord did command it. Gather it every man according to his eating. And Omar, every man according to the number of his person. And take every man for them which is his tent. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. So in verse 17, if you had a big family, some folks gathered a whole lot of it. <laughs> If you had a small family, you just gathered enough for your family, just enough for that day. Now, verse 18, And when they eat it, met it with an Omar, he gathered much and had nothing over. Underline nothing over in verse 18. Nothing over, nothing left over. And he that gathered little had no lack. He just had enough. The fellow that gathered enough just had enough to get him through the day. All right. Uh, and gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morrow. Okay? You didn't take and say, I'll save some for tomorrow just to make good measure just in case it don't come down tomorrow. I'm going to have enough here to make sure that I don't want to have to go out there and get it. I'm just going to have me a little left over. I'm just going to eat a little less than today. And I'm not real hungry, so I'm going to eat a little less. I'm going to save it tomorrow. Moses, don't you do that. You don't leave nothing left for tomorrow. Now, verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearken not to Moses. Now, underline that. That's the way folks are. They're rebellious, stubborn, <laughs> stiff-necked. Uh, but some of them left of it until the morrow. Now, watch what happens. And it bred worms. Underline that in verse uh, 20. It bred worms. 
So what they saved over for the next day, uh, had a, if they had a big old pot of it, it turned to worms of worms was inside of that thing. Woo! Must be some terrible stuff. <laughs> and did what? And stank. This is not frost. This is not snow. This is, this is something else. All right. And Moses uh, was wrath with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. It laughed. Uh, it, rained, it snowed here last night. It snowed here last night. And if you went outside, you'd have said, oh, well, there it is. Then when the sun got hot, it's all gone. Just like today. It's all gone. It's not that. Now, verse 22, and it come to pass, that on the six days they gathered twice as much bread. Uh, two Omars, one for a man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake. Now I'm lying in verse 23. Bake, bake. So they took this thing, and they gathered it up, and they ground it into a meal, and baked it. Now you got to get the cross reference right here, right down. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And skip for a minute over to Numbers chapter 11. And watch this manna again. And there they grind it into a meal and cook it into cakes. Cook it into cakes. Numbers chapter 11. And let's pick up verse uh, 6. Number it will Hold your hand there at verse 23, number 16, 23, and go to Numbers chapter 11 and pick up verse 6. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all besides this, underline it, verse 6, manna, manna before our eyes, verse 7. And a manna was as a corn or seed. I didn't find out what the corn or seed is. Maybe somebody can help me out. Anybody got a cross reference for a corn or seed? Coriander seed. Come, somebody help me. White in color. All right. And the color thereof was the color of the bedellum. Bellum. Bellum. Why a D? There's a B in front of it. There's that thing again. <laughs> There's the silent B. <laughs> okay, uh, Dullam. And it occurs in Genesis chapter two, verse twelve. It's some kind. It's some kind of white stone. Another. It's found in Genesis chapter two, verse twelve. Now, verse eight. And the people went about and gathered it. Now, underline this. And ground it in meals, and beat it in a mortar. Underline verse 8, beat it in a what? So they took that thing and ground it. It's, it's like wheat. It's like wheat falling. Grab that wheat, put it down in there, and you know what you do with wheat? You put wheat in there and you smash the wheat, ground the wheat up, and ground it into powder so you can make cakes out of it. This flour made it into flour. So whatever the stuff was, it was like wheat that they hit and ground into a powder and made bread out of a thing and cooked it and made cakes out of it. So underline it in verse 8. They beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans. Underline that. Baked it in pans. They baked it in pans. And made cakes of it. Make cakes of that thing. And so it's very, very similar to bread. And the taste, taste, underline the word taste, and the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. Fresh oil. Ah. Uh, Olive oil. Olive oil. Have you ever had olive oil? You ever you ever taken olive oil and cooked anything in olive oil? Man, I, I mean olive oil you could is I mean it's real good that's some good stuff, boy. <laughs> Cook an egg in olive oil. You'll know you you had a nice egg cooked in olive oil if you can afford to. It's real expensive. Uh, it's real expensive stuff, but boy, you take it hunting and pour a little egg out there and put a little olive oil in it and cook it, boy. It, it's too expensive to use that away, but it's good stuff. All right, now back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 16. 
So they uh, beat it like flour and they ground it into a, a powder and made cakes out of it and baked it in pans and cooked it and tasted like fresh oil. Now, verse 24, and they laid it up till the morning and Moses bid and did not stink. Underline that in verse 24. Did not stink. So that's a weird thing. So on Friday, instead of breeding worms and stinking, it changes the whole situation and it doesn't. It doesn't. All right. Uh, neither was there worms therein. No worms in it. Every other day there's worms in it, but not on, not on uh, Friday. Isn't that, a, isn't that a wild deal? That must be quite a thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, if they baked, if they baked it back here, it changed. Back here, it, it bred worms and stank. If they baked it back here, they said, "I'm going to break me enough to last two days. I ain't going to go out and get mine. I'm going to bake up enough here and get up enough and bake it up enough, and I'm just not going to go get it in the morning." The next morning, behold, it had full of worms and it stunk. Baked it or didn't bake it. So the day has a lot to do with it. But don't you know the Lord honors the Sabbath? What did he do? He's saying, okay, the Sabbath is the day that you're supposed to rest in, and so I'm going to make this stuff not stink and not turn to worms on that day, because Saturday you're not supposed to work on Saturday. So Saturday they didn't do nothing, and it didn't stink because the Lord had his hand upon it. All right, now, uh, verse 35, And Moses said, Eat that today, for the day is, there it is, verse 25, Sabbath unto the Lord. There it is. Sabbath unto the Lord. The day, today ye shall not find it in the field. Underline that. Not find it in the field. So every day they went out except Saturday, it was there. If they went out Saturday, it wasn't there. My boy ain't that a shot. <laughs> Whatever this stuff, it only comes down six days a week. And that Saturday, it don't fall. So it comes out of heaven. Not some special stuff, boy. You ain't seen nothing like it around here, and there's nothing in the land of Israel like it today. It's something God just gave them out of heaven. Now, verse uh, 27, And it come to pass that there went out some of the people. <laughs> Underline that, went out some of the people. Back to verse 20. <laughs> but some of them left of it until the morning. That's the way some folks are. If you had a, a few folks, some folks just won't listen and they just can't hear. They heard, they got a rebellious heart, they just want to do their own thing. It's kind of like saying, I'm just going to see for myself. And then they do their thing. Verse 27 now, Come to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather. And they found none. It wasn't there. They went out to find it to see if it was there and it wasn't there. Well, Moses told them it wouldn't be there. God told Moses it wouldn't be there, and Moses told them it wouldn't be there, and they still had to go out and find for themselves that it wasn't there. Verse 28, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? Verse 28, What did the Lord think about those folks going out to look for it? He was ticked. He was ticked just because they went outside to look to see if it was there. Verse 20, See, for that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gave uh, you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Now, underline this. Abide ye ever man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the Sabbath day. So the Lord says, okay, I don't want you even going out to the house to look for that manna when it falls. I don't want you to go out when the sun comes up and it's all melted, then you can go out. But don't you go out till that thing is melted. Don't you go outdoors and look. You stay right in the house. So the Lord has a thing with disobedience, don't he? So when the Lord says something, you want to say, Lord, that's what I want to do. So when you read the book and the Lord convicts you of something, then you say, Lord, help me obey what you said in that book. Now, verse, uh, verse 29. Abide every man in his own place. Let no man go out. Underline that. That's very important. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like corn. Uh, what is it? Cornor? Coriander. Coriander seed. White. Underline that. It's white. It's white. 
looks like snow. White. And the taste thereof is like uh, wafers made with honey. So it's sweet. It's sweet. It's a sweet, uh, it's angel food cake. <laughs> it tastes pretty good stuff. Uh, now, verse 32. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, Phil and Omar, and so on, down through the passage there. Now, verse 35. Let's get verse 35 before we go on. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years, underline that, till they came into the land of habitation. So they eat this manna for 40 years, and as soon as they crossed the Jordan River, right down the cross reference, Joshua, take your Bible and turn to Joshua, and turn to Joshua chapter uh, 5, and look at verse 12. Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. As soon as they crossed the Jordan River and go in to fight the battle of Jericho, uh, that manna stops. It's no, it doesn't fall another day. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. Now, if you know your Bible, you know Joshua is going in and fighting the battle of Jericho. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 12 says, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither did the children of Israel uh, manna any more, but did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So the manna ceases when they cross the Jordan River going in to fight the battle of Jericho. All right, uh, now take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John. We'll pick up a few verses that are connected with this manna. Go to the Gospel of John and go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And uh, John chapter 6, and let's begin with verse 31. John 6, 31. Our fathers did eat manna, there it is, underline the word, in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. Now, did he give them bread from heaven? Was that manna come from heaven? How many of you believe that, folks, that that manna came from heaven? Okay. To eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Moses gave you, now what's that next word? Not that bread from heaven. I don't know, wait a minute, wait a minute. He just got through saying he gave them bread from heaven. Now he says he gave them not that bread from heaven. Now, so right here you want to write in your notes, the manna didn't come from where Christ came from. Christ came from the third heaven. The manna comes from the second heaven. Now how many know there's three heavens in the Bible? Three of them. Three heavens. Now you want to make that certain, because take your Bible and turn to Second Corinthians, and notice the second, the three heavens are absolute, and you want to have the three heavens down, because the manna itself doesn't come from where Jesus Christ came from. Jesus Christ come from the third heaven where God the Father is. The manna comes from the second heaven, not the third heaven. Now, get 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. And it says, I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Such a one caught up to the what? Third heaven. That's where Christ came from. He was the bread from heaven. The other manna that Moses gave him came from the second heaven. There's three of them. Now, you ought to know these, and you ought to study them. And in the Bible, it talks about heaven many, many, many times. And you can only tell what heaven God is talking about by the context. And he goes back and forth. Heaven, sometimes... It doesn't tell you which one it's talking about. There's a first heaven, there's a second heaven, and there's a third heaven. And it'll say heaven many times in the Bible. And he will not explain which one he's talking about. The only way you'll know is by the context. 
by reading the context, what I mean by that is the verses in front of it and the verses in back of it, and then you will determine by that whether he's talking about the third heaven, whether he's talking about the seven he seven, second heaven, or whether he's talking about the first heaven. Now, look at Genesis chapter 1, and somebody tell me which heaven he's talking about in Genesis chapter 1, and in verse... Uh, I want a particular verse. No, that's not the heaven I want to talk about. Uh, verse 20. Verse 20. See the last word in verse 20? Heaven. How many say it's the first heaven? How many say it's the second heaven? How many say it's the third heaven? What heaven is it? It's the first. Why? Because that's where the birds and the fowls fly. That's where the birds are at. They're up in heaven. So sometimes in you in the Bible, talk about heaven, it'll be right up there where the clouds are at. It'll be right up here. You can see it. You can look at it. Right up there. Talk about the heaven. Talk about the clouds. But it's it used the word heaven. Now talk about the third heaven or the second heaven. Talk about the first heaven. Now, verse, look at it again. Look at verse 14, verse 14, and underline the word heaven in the middle of verse 14. Heaven in the middle of verse 14. Somebody tell me what heaven that is. Second heaven. What's in the second heaven? The sun and the moon and the stars are in it. So the galaxies are in the second heaven. So when you just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, that's the third heaven where God the Father is. The second heaven is where the sun and the moon and all the stars are out there in the galaxies, millions and billions and billions and billions and billions of galaxies. And the first heaven's up here where the birds fly. And you can only know that throughout the Bible. Use that word hundreds of times. That word right there, heaven, will occur so many times you can't even tell which one he's talking about if you don't read the context. And don't say it's the third heaven every time you see it. Don't say it's the second heaven every time you see it. Don't say it's the first heaven every time you see it. you got to get it by the context. That's the only way you can get it. Uh, you, you all understand what I just said? Okay. Now, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And verse uh, 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, and say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the, underline it, true bread from heaven. So the true bread is the opposite of what? The false bread. A true bread, and then there's a false bread. Now, did Moses get the true bread from heaven? No, the true bread from heaven is Jesus Christ. Now go on. Verse 33. And the bread of God, and the bread of God is what? Is he which come down from heaven and give life unto the world. Then said he unto uh, him, Lord, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto him, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall uh, never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. He's the bread of life. Okay, now look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And uh, pick up verse uh, 58. Verse uh, 58. Uh, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live what? So who is he talking about when he says the true bread? Talking about himself. Talking about himself. So take your Bible right there in verse 58 and underline the word, this is that true bread. This is that true bread. Now, to give a, get off a little bit, uh, take that and, and write down Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, and watch the same expression, this. And he's actually pointing to himself. When he says, this is that bread which come down from heaven, he's, saying, he's pointing to himself like this. 
This is that bread that come down from heaven. He's pointing right straight back at himself. Now, Matthew chapter 16, and the great verse that the Roman Catholic Church has had such a terrible time with, and they've had such a terrible time with it, it just de devastated many a, a, a Catholic. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I say unto, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he said unto Peter, uh, he said unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon, underline it, this rock, he ain't pointing to Peter, he's pointing to himself. This rock, when he says this rock, he's saying, I'm the rock the church is built on. The church is built on me, not Peter. See the thing? Now look back at John, John chapter 6, verse 58. This, and notice the this rock in verse Matthew 16, 18, this rock. This is that bread. He's pointing right straight to himself. That'll straighten out Matthew 16. <laughs> Make it clear to you. All right. Uh, this is the bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and did die. Hey, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, take your Bible and turn to the uh, book of uh, Psalms. Psalms chapter 78. Psalms chapter 78. The book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 78. Now keep in mind we're talking about this manna and we're talking about hidden manna. And we're trying to see some things about it, where it comes from and what it is. Psalm chapter 78. And look at uh, verse uh, 23. Psalm 78, 23. And there he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the door of heaven and had rained down manna, underline that, rained down manna, it's like coming out of, it's like rain coming down to the earth, up, uh, upon them to eat, and had given them, here it is, the corn of heaven. So he calls it here, the corn of heaven, that's why they ground the thing and made it into cakes, the corn of heaven. And man did eat what? Angel's food. So I said, it's angel food cake, and you laughed. <laughs> There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. All right. Uh, now take your Bible and turn to Psalms 105. Psalms 105. And uh, look at verse 40. Psalms 105 and verse 40. Psalms 105, verse 40, And the people asked, And he brought quail, and satisfied them with the, there it is again, the bread of heaven. So this bread comes from the second heaven. You say, why do you keep saying the second heaven? Let's read, a little, let's keep on going. Take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. And let's pick up verse uh, 22 and 23. And it says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of snow? Hast thou seen the treasures of hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against a day of battle of war. Okay, now, in order to get this passage, you got to understand what it is in verse 23. Which, verse 23, Job chapter 38, Job chapter 38, verse 23, which I have reserved. So underline the word reserved. That means he reserved the thing from back here, he's reserved it all the way up to here. He's reserved it up to there. Now, watch what it is. Reserved again, now watch it, the time of 
trouble. The time of trouble. Now you have three cross references in your notes. You have uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. You have Matthew chapter 24 verse 21. And you have Daniel chapter 12. Now let's look at these three verses to explain to you what it means the time of trouble. Because if you don't get that, you won't get the verse in front of it. All right, now you've got to get uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 30, in verse 7, you want to get the hidden manna. You want to get it and you want to see it in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great. Now, underline this verse, because this verse matches Matthew 24, 21. So that none is like it. None is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Okay? It's a time of Jacob's trouble. Underline that. But Jacob shall be saved out of it. So what does it mean, Jacob's trouble? Jacob standing for the children of Israel, standing for the Jews. So the, it's the tribulations called Jacob's trouble, but what? But the Antichrist is going to persecute them and kill them, but what? They're going to be saved out of it. They're not going to be completely killed off. But he's going to kill a whole bunch of them. You say, why is that important? How many Jews did Hitler kill? Now, if Hitler killed uh, millions of them, how many do you suppose the Antichrist is going to kill? He's going to kill a whole slug of them. So, he says at the end of the verse, but he shall be saved out of it. He's not going to be annihilated, but he's sure going to be killed off. Now, take your Bible and go to Matthew 24 and pick up verse 21. This is Jacob's trouble, and there's never been a time since it nor ever will be. It's a, one of the worst times in all history of mankind from the beginning of the earth to the end of the earth. There's going to be nothing ever take place like uh, the Great Tribulation. And of course, you can figure that out if you've read the book of Revelation. If it doesn't rain for three and a half years, don't you know all hell is going to break loose? Why? Why? If it doesn't rain for three and a half years, you know what's going to happen, folks. Nobody's going to have anything to eat. And what happens when folks don't have things to eat? They start eating each other. That's what they will do. Matthew chapter 24, and watch it again. Thank God you and I are not going to be here. If you're saved, you're not going to be here. Matthew chapter 24, and pick up verse 21. It says in verse 21, For then, underline the word then because it's a time thing. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, going all the way back to Adam, unto this time, no, nor ever shall be, goes all the way to the end. So the tribulation is the worst time it's ever going to occur on the earth, and that's why it matches Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, and watch Daniel chapter 12. Now take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 12 and look at verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. All three passages show you that's talking about the great tribulation. So the passage we're reading in Job, where it says the time of trouble, you've got to get that or you won't get the verse in front of it. All right, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael... Stand up for the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be, now watch it, underline it, this matches Jeremiah chapter 30. It matches 24. Now it says, A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even uh, to the same time. And at that time the people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book of life. Now, but found written in the book of life. Where have we read that before? Found written in the book of life, folks. Where did you find that written? It? Where you find that at? Revelation. So write it down the margin of your Bible. Revelation chapter three, verse five. Found written in the book. 
Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, the book of Lions are written there. They're all matches. Now go back to Job chapter 38, verse 23, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, the great tribulation. So he's talking about that period of time right there, the seven-year period of time, or three and a half years, second half of the tribulation. All right. Against question. No. Said the book, just written in a book. Didn't say the book of life, just said written in the book. But he said somebody was written in the book, and he's talking about these folks right there, the Jews that are written in the book. So you're taking for granted the book of life. May not be the book of life, but it said may be another book, may be two of the number ones. Because it didn't say the book of life. You're just taking that for granted. But maybe you shouldn't take anything for granted. <laughs> but they're written in the book. Now, verse uh, 23. Which I have reserved against the time of trouble. Against, now get the second part of it. Against the day of battle and war. So against the day of battle and war. That's the second part of it. So what time is that? You've got four cross-references. Revelation 16, 16. You have the word of and again. That's the battle of Armageddon right there. You get it again. Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. And the blood flows to the horse's vitals. There it is. Armageddon again. And Zechariah chapter 14, 1 through 15. All of them, all the cross-references are given for that time right there. It's called... The time of trouble, which is Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, then the end of the tribulation against the day of battle and war. You say, why did you point that all out? So you can look back at verse 22. Now go back to verse 22. Hast thou entered into what? The treasures of the snow. So that's aimed at that manna down there in the tribulation. Everybody else is starving to death, and here the children of Israel are hiding and God's feeding them with manna because they've overcome the mark of the beast. So they get up in the morning and down comes food. They go out and get their food, bring it in and hide again. So they got something to eat and everybody else is starving to death. Next day, go out in the morning and gather it and go back in. They do it six days a week. And then on the sixth day, they go out and gather enough for two days and go back in and hide again. Because they're running for the life then and Christ's trying to kill them. And God's feeding them with manna. It's called hidden manna. Now, take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50 and watch it again. Jeremiah and Jeremiah chapter 50, the great prophet of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 50 and uh, look at verse uh, 19. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 19. <clears throat> and it says, And I will bring Israel again. Take your pen and underline it. Again. All right. When God brings Israel again, uh, that happened. Read it in the margin of your Bible. That happened in 1948. Uh, again. Right beside the word again, he made him a nation again in 1948. The Jewish nation was scattered into the rest of the world for almost 2,000 years. For pretty near 2,000 years, the Jewish nation was scattered. He said, I'll bring them again. Happened in 1948, they become a nation again. Now, ain't that something? Jewish nation being scattered to the winds of the world, and nobody knew where they were for almost 2,000 years, and all of a sudden, up pops the Jewish nation and their nation again, 1948. Now, that's something, brother. Uh, uh, verse uh, 19, I will bring Israel again to habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. Now verse 20, you've got to get verse 20 before you can get verse 19. In those days, and at that time, underline those days, and that time, what's he telling you? He's telling you when he's going to take place, verse 19. In those days, in that time, shall the Lord, uh, the, uh, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And, now here's the key, their 
shall be what? None. So it hadn't happened to Israel yet. You can find the next Israel. They don't even believe in Jesus Christ yet. All right. And the sins of Judah. So he covers all 12 tribes. And, and now underline it. And they shall not be found. Right in the margin of your Bible, the millennium. So God has forgiven the nation of Israel. The sins of Israel will be sought for. And the sins of Judah, and they will not be found. God will forgive them. And the nation of Israel will get completely right with God. And everything will be okay. That's the advent. Right down the margin of your Bible, the second advent of Christ when he comes back to this earth. Now, you have in your notes, you have some cross-references for that. You have, uh, you have uh, Romans chapter 11. You have Romans chapter 11, verse 26. You have Hebrews chapter 8, 8 and 9. You have Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 8. And you have Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Let's get one of those. Uh, Romans chapter 11. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 11. And I'll let you study the other cross references. Romans chapter 11. Now Paul writes of it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 11 and pick up verse 26. Romans chapter 11 verse 26 says, And so all what? Israel, 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 Israel shall be saved. As written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away uh, ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. There it is. That's the nation of Israel. That hasn't happened yet. That happened at the advent of Christ. He will take away their sins. Not yet. Now, back to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50, and this time, let's go back and pick up verse 19. Now you'll be able to compare verse 19 with the hidden manna that the children of Israel are fed with in the wilderness, and it'll match Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 19 says, And I will bring Israel again to his habitation. Brought him back to the land of Israel. That happens, and it aimed at the tribulation. And he, the nation of Israel, shall do what? Feed, feed. So when the Antichrist comes in and sits down on the mercy seat and says, I am Christ, the Jews scatter and run out of Jerusalem and run for their lives, and they run to hide. And these are the places they go to hide, and when they hide there, God's going to bring down manna and feed them there. Where's the first place? He's going to feed on Carmel. Carmel. That's the first one. And Carmel is found in your Bible. Uh, I give you the description of where it's found. Uh, Carmel is found. Uh, Mount Carmel is found. Uh, this place is one of the places that the Jews will be fed with manna. There is hidden manna where they hide. Carmel is on the sea coast. Uh, straight west of the Sea of Galilee. So if you want to find Carmel on your map, if you look at a map, you come down a sea coast like this and a little jog out there like that. Comes down like that and the Sea of uh, Galilee is over here and the Jordan River is here and the Dead Sea is there. If you went straight across like this on that map, you'd see Carmel right here. Find the map in the back of your Bible. You have any maps in the back of your Bible? How many have a map in the back of your Bible? Go on the map in the back of your Bible, look down there, and there's a little jog coming down the sea coast, like this. Right there. That's where Elijah fought with the uh, prophets of Baal and killed 450 prophets of Baal. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff happened at Count, Mount Carmel. Y'all study it in the Bible and see what happened there. <laughs> but that's one of the places they'll be. That's going to be the Holy Spirit showing them the Scripture, and they're going to go there, and the Holy Spirit's going to guide them there, and they're running for their lives. Here's the Antichrist come in, and as they run for their lives, the the ones that are their enemies today, the ones, the descendants of Esau, which are there, they're the Arabs, and they're the ones that are uh, to this day their enemy. 
and I, there, uh, Jordan, right by Jordan, that place right there, that the descendants of Esau, and they're going to kill a whole bunch of Jews as they flee from Israel. It's in Isaiah and it's in Jeremiah. And they're going to kill those Jews as they run for their life. They're going to kill them by the hundreds as they leave running for their lives from the Jews because they won't worship the Antichrist. And when they flee, boy, they're going to flee these places. Now they're given. I give them to you. They're right here in the scripture. They're uh, Carmel, Bashan, and Bashan. I showed you where Bashan was. Bashan, this is not a good map here. Bashan is uh, Bashan's over in this area. Over in on this side, Bashan and uh, Mount Ephraim and uh, Gilead. Gilead's over in uh, uh, Golan, over in this way. Golan and, and up towards uh, there's a mountain up this way, Mount Hermon, like that. All right, uh, and uh, and uh, Sela Petra, that's another one. And all the, and Sela Petra is down south of the Dead Sea down in the uh, land of Moab, down in here. And those are the places that the Jewish nation will run for their life and hide and God will feed them with manna in those places. Now, got to get one more scripture. Take your Bible and turn to, uh, now it looks like we ain't going to have time to finish them. Uh, let's mark them and there will be about four or five verses we need to go over and, and get them later. So let's put a mark on them. Uh, let's, let's stop at, uh, uh, let's begin at, uh, Hosea, Hosea, Ezekiel, Michael, Lamentations, and Matthew. Let's get those one, two, three, four, five. Let's get those five scriptures later. Now you can go home and look up those five scriptures and meditate upon them and think about them, but they're aimed at the hidden manna of Revelation chapter, uh, two, verse 17. All right. Uh, any questions? All right. Uh, next Wednesday night, I won't have any services, so we'll uh, see the Wednesday after that. All right. What else you need to remember in prayer then? Prayer request. Appreciate you praying from a preaching down at Sean's. Pray the Lord will give him a revival and give his people a revival. And uh, pray for his wedding. Okay, what else we need to pray for? All right. All right, let's pray that. Lord, touch his heart and bring him out of the coma. And one of those words, it's like spaghetti. 